All right, welcome back. Today I have a very cool game from my collection of Shusaku Kifu. This is the 29th Kifu in the collection, which goes to um, 471 games. It's a quite expansive uh, Chinese volume. And uh, this is kind of a cool game because this is the first um, recorded game from Shusaku being 3Don. And the game is from 1842, so he's still very young. And his opponent is a 5-don, so he's getting two stones. And man, I think that a lot of people at this point were probably like, we need to promote this kid faster because he's just destroying us at two stones. And that's one thing that Shusaku was particularly good at, was maintaining his advantage. And um, he was said to be invincible with the black stones, that he would just husband that first move advantage so that he would always win by at least a point. There was no Comey back then, so you would have to win by a full point. But, um, you know, just a, a really good player, especially, um, you know, he was definitely a child prodigy. And uh, so I wanted to do another historical game, and uh, we start out, White takes the 4-3, uh, and this is kind of a common common strategy in handicap games, and this is, you know, particularly not when I'm playing a two-stone game, but if I'm playing like a six-stone teaching game or something, one thing that I'll often do is the first corner that we start playing, I will give my opponent almost as much territory as they want, like even be it 20, 30 points in the corner, as long as I can get thickness on the outside. Because once I have that thickness and there's the rest of the game to go, I know that, like, the fighting is going to get complicated and I'm going to be able to slowly catch up uh, when my opponent makes mistakes in complicated fighting. Uh, so Black just says, okay, take my 3-4 in the other corner. White immediately approaches, and this is something you'll see, is White plays very, very fast in this opening, trying to create a complicated situation and uh, develop as rapidly as possible to make up for the handicap stones. And so what we'll see is that instead of continuing uh, Joseki in the upper left after black pincers tightly, um, which, is, which is a good pincer because it's like, if there's fighting, we've got the stone here and the stone here, so there's not really any way that white is going to think, okay, if I get into a fight here, I'm going to have an advantage in some way. So white just sweeps over and splits the upper side, which is kind of an interesting maneuver. And... When your opponent unexpectedly tanukis, even in the opening when there's a joseki and your opponent says, okay, you pincered my stone, I don't care, I'm going to take this big point, one thing that you can look at, uh, and this is just a way to help you find good moves, is that if your opponent ignores a move that you think they should probably respond to, follow up with it. So what we can see right now is Black says, okay, you're splitting the upper side, all right, I'm just going to clamp down on this stone, and now I know I'm getting a really good result in the upper left corner. And white decides to save the stone uh, pretty simply, but this black shape is just so thick, and the way that white is sealed in on both sides is really bad. Like, even in a 3-3 invasion, just to go and demonstrate something here, you know, even in this sort of, like, you know, blind... Thing, white's not sealed in on the right. Like, you know, if black has a stone over here, like, this is still open at the bottom. And, and white could even, depending on the situation, if white ends up with a stone, like, you know, over here later, you know, black has something like this, white could even, like, you know, jump out and, you know, connect to the outside still. So, you know, this result here is much, much better for white. We can see the amount of territory is probably close to the same you know, that we've definitively established, you know, for white in these two corners. But being completely sealed in on both sides, these four white stones just have no bearing on the rest of the game. They can't link up to anything. They can't save anything. They're just securing territory. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, black A has this wall facing, you know, well, actually, let's go back to the game so it doesn't look like black is just dominating the upper side with these two big walls. Um, because this wall facing the upper side, which admittedly is not you know, this stone's in a good position to make it a base on either side, so, you know, this stone's limiting this a little bit, but these two stones here are relating really well with the star point stone here. Like, this is a nice space. There's a lot of potential in here for black to make territory. 
And, you know, when you give your opponent potential on both sides of the corner, we can tell that, you know, this is obviously not a very good result for white, but white got to take Sente twice. Once to play this splitting move on the top, and another time now to play this extension on the bottom. And you can see, you know, white is just playing super, super fast here. Like, not enclosing corners, making big extensions, taking big points, um, you know, trying to keep black off balance in some way. Uh, black plays here. This was really common off the star point uh, back in the mid, uh, mid-1800s, mid was to make this large knight's extension and then hope to, uh, hope to enclose the corner at A to take a lot of territory very quickly. You'll see that uh, this is a really common tactic off of a handicap stone in these games from the uh, you know 1840s, and you know it's not till later that the uh, the small knight's extension at B becomes a little bit more standardized because it protects the corner a little bit more. But in any event, uh, white doesn't even make a base here, which is kind of surprising. But we could see that just a two-point extension is not very big. You know, if if white extends to A and black encloses at B. It seems like black's getting a lot more for the moves than white's getting, especially you're extending towards this wall, so you're not even 100% safe yet. Um, whereas now, white sort of has this pseudo double wing formation, and at this point, you know, giving white C would just be way too good. Like, this, this would take the corner on a large scale and create this excellent double wing formation with the two white extensions. So black kind of ha has to dive in here and do something. And here we can see white's plan is white's going to pincer this severely. And, you know, the thing is, is that black, black could live by, you know, playing something like A and just eke out maybe like eight, ten points in the corner. But white's just going to get super thick, and white already has extensions on both sides. So taking 10 points in the corner and giving your opponent 15 on the right and 15 on the bottom, that's not working. So black comes through the opening here. And in this shape, um, you know, this is something that whenever you make this, you know, two-point diagonal jump here between A and B, um, sometimes this is called an elephant's jump, or this inside point will be called the eye of the elephant. Whenever you make this maneuver, you've got to think what you're going to do if black comes straight through. In a lot of situations, this two-point diagonal jump is, is more for making sabaki or escaping danger, the idea being that when black comes through, it's really easy to sacrifice one of the stones and make a solid position on the other side. Like, we can see, if we didn't care about the P4 stone, we could just do this, you know, and jump out. And we have this great shape relating back to this uh, stone here, you know. So, if you're willing to sacrifice one of the stones, this would be one way to do it. In this game, however, we're essentially giving up a very important stone and letting our opponent take fifth line territory so this isn't working in this game but you know that's this is one option to consider when you don't want to sacrifice one of the stones though the typical maneuver is to continue attacking with the knight's move which is what white does in the game and uh you know obviously this is a symmetrical position so you'd also want to look at the other knight's move you know um but in this case um you know this stone has a little bit better relation with this stone. It's one line closer. So uh, we do this um, to uh, strengthen the weaker connection with the extension on the bottom side. And the idea of this move is it's sort of like similar in logic to, um, to a net in that sometimes, depending on the whole board situation, um, it's not actually possible for black to break through this encirclement. In this particular position, uh, black can play this and come back to capture the one stone here. Um, but we can see uh, that if, uh, you know, the board situation were slightly different, um, <clears throat> you know, white might be able to hold black in with this encirclement and keep black from getting to the outside. Now, like I said, as it stands in the game, uh, it's not quite going to work, but black is going to have to struggle to get out here a little bit. Uh, so white just extends, and this is the thing, is that, you know, when you're attacking, you often want to play the more conservative move that gives your opponent nothing to force with, 
because even, you know, if we hunt it here, obviously we can see that this cut is working. But even if this cut wasn't working, like if white had a, you know, um, if the situation was different and white had a stone here, this black attachment here might be working. And then after, you know, after something like this, maybe black's alive in the corner. We're not too worried about it. Um, so instead of giving, um, giving himself a cutting point or something, white just withdraws directly. Black pushes, white extends again, black pushes again, and now white hanes. White counter, or black, rather, counter hanes to keep trying to get to the outside. And uh, we can see here white peeps at this cutting point. And there's, there's an important principle here. Um, it's a, there's a Go proverb that says, force before defending. And this is a good example of when and why that works. Um, because instead of connecting directly, you know, and then letting, you know, white do whatever, play here or come back and defend this side, you know, white could defend either side, depending on which white thought was more important. But instead of just connecting right away, black throws in this Atari. And the reason that this forcing move works is that if white tries to ignore this and carry through with the intention of the peep, well, now it's not a cutting point anymore. So white has to respond to this Atari, or the move at A is essentially wasted in terms of its intention. So we can see that, indeed, white connects, and then black goes back and connects. But black got this forcing move in for free in that exchange. So just something to look at is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, if your opponent peeps or something, maybe you can make a threatening move that, you know, um, threatens to resolve the potential cut um, in a totally different way um, instead of just connecting solidly and heavy. Because we can see these stones are getting pretty heavy here. Like, you know, they're, there's too, it's too big to sacrifice now, but there's still no eye shape at all. You know, like black, even getting a, another move in the corner, you probably are only getting one eye at this point. So it's, uh, whereas, you know, white is trying to essentially develop positions on both sides. So white comes back to defend the, the lower side. Because uh, obviously now black cutting through, you know, these these three stones um, right up against the black wall are a little thin. So white has to defend something there. Uh, and then uh, black, you know, presses over here saying, you know, this group is out. It's just here to keep you from making territory. I'm going to build up my own position. And these two stones, I mean, with the black thickness up here, you know, this area is getting to be really large for black. So, you know, white would like to do something about this, but at the moment has no time because you can see that now that this side has good potential, a black pincer at A is going to be really brutal because then this stone's going to be running out, and if this stone is under attack, white won't have the time to do everything that he needs to do on the board. So white makes a base up here. Um, black reduces the lower side while expanding his moyo on the left, which is a good all-purpose move. And then when white just comes back like this, you know, black can just say, well, this exchange is good for me. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm good with that, you know? So here, uh, again, limiting the total size of the bottom while potentially getting some eye shape down here. And, um, you know, th this hane doesn't work per se, uh, because white can push in here in Atari. But, uh, you know, it gives black this, you know, descent in, eh, I guess it's not 100% sente. White might choose to ignore this descent. Um, but it does allow, uh, uh, it gives black definitely some liberties, one eye for sure, more or less. Uh, and then it lets black pull off this crazy maneuver, which isolates this one stone and forces this group to live on a really small scale. You can see, yeah, it's just like, we're getting six, seven points in Gote for white. And, uh, you know, there's obviously, there's weaknesses in black's shape here. But, uh, you know, if black gets to build, like, a Moyo in the upper right, too, with all this potential on the left, like, this game is going very well for black. And this is why I think people <laughs> are probably getting frustrated at having to play him at two stones and be like, 
you know, maybe in an even game, like, I'd have a chance, but when you've got two stones against a professional opponent, it's just, there's no way they're going to give up that advantage. I'd be really curious to see what the win-loss record for modern professionals playing a two-stone handicap game against each other, because I could imagine that the person taking two stones would probably win at least 90% of the time. Um, it would just be kind of ridiculous. Um, especially because, you know, um, uh, without Comey as they were playing in these days, you know, the, the advantage to black is pretty huge. But uh, like I said, you know, black has the weakness, so black comes back and protects that, you know. So uh, I guess white does live in Sente here. But, you know, black gets really thick on the outside by cutting off this one stone. And this stone isn't 100% captured yet, but it would not really be feasible to run out with it directly either. So instead, white uh, approaches here, and we can see white's idea. White is trying to use the Aji in the A stone to simultaneously approach the corner and possibly threaten to come back and capture the stones at B at some point. I, you know, right now it's obviously not working, but maybe if White gets a few more stones over here and then comes out with A, White can just swallow up the B stones. So that's what White is aiming at. And uh, black just protects the corner, and white jumps out. Uh, simply extending would be a little, would be heavy in this case, because uh, the reason white wants to jump is that if black does play like a wedge at A, we don't necessarily need to save the stone at B. Um, you know, like, we could use it as a sacrifice, we could use it as a forcing move. Um, whereas... If we simply extend here, which in the absence of other stones, this would be the usual move. Well, now, now we kind of have to save both these stones. So if black comes and caps this, well, now we're really not sure what to do because we've got to somehow struggle out with these two stones. It's just not, you know, when you're, when you're playing in your enemy's area, having your stones not be physically connected can be a good thing because it, it means you don't have to save each individual stone. And that's, whenever you're playing in your opponent's area, you should definitely be prepared to sacrifice stones here and there to get a, just a viable position somewhere. And we'll see white try really hard in here. Um, black executes sort of a leaning maneuver over here to build up some strength in the center to attack uh, these two or three stones, depending on how you want to look at it comes back. Um, white extends to the center to aim at, you know, connecting with these stones, which is a good idea. Black jumps out to prevent that connection, and now you can see this is kind of a difficult situation for white because these stones, you know, if they get swallowed on a large scale, that's bad. If, if black comes in and, like, wedges and then Ataris and takes one stone off the board with, like, three moves, that's not really a big deal. But if black just plays out here and just swallows these naturally, this would be a huge territorial win. So, uh, white goes into action using all the Aji. Which is pretty exciting. Uh, and, and you can just tell white is, is behind pretty much this whole game, because white is always the one struggling inside black's area, essentially. And... Uh, you know, white is, like I said, using all the Aji. Uh, this is this is always a scary situation, you know. The, you've got these two cutting points. Uh, Black Atari is the stone. It takes that stone off the board. And here we can see, you know, white is trying to capture these two stones here and just connect these to the side, which is already alive, which would be good. be very good. And here, Black manages to start a co, which is definitely exciting. And, uh, you know, both sides definitely have co-threats. Um, you know, the, it's, it's not that early in the game, and there's already, like, you know, this cut here would be super devastating, because that would turn this wall into four weak, heavy stones. Um, and this stone and these stones would be in a good position to attack it. And it would also destroy the, uh, the influence projecting down the left, because there would be this cut, there would be this, you know. 
it would really, really break apart Black's shape. And then similarly, too, just capturing this one stone here would kill the side, so that's not viable. And Black recaptures. Uh, white comes here, threatening to cut off the three stones, uh, then, which would also threaten to capture the two stones, which would save this group. Uh, and Black just says no. Nope. I am resolving this. Uh, I, want, uh, I want these stones to be weak. So White cuts and uh, black has to come out like this to save the stones and you know you you don't want to make an empty triangle but you know obviously if it's the only move that works it's the only move that works so it happens from time to time and then white comes and cuts off the three stones on the top which is this is getting really dicey uh, so black starts another co <laughs> Uh, and then this this cut makes um, the ensuing co-threat larger because it's an actual Atari against these stones. So what we can see here, black starts the co, so white's going to have to have to capture here. Uh, and then black makes the co-threat, which is a direct Atari. It's not just cutting and then threatening to, you know, Atari on the next move. This move is an Atari. Uh, white resolves it because, you know, white kind of needs to do something. And this breaks the corner, you know. But in return, black gets to just really hurt this group on the upper side. And you'll notice that, like, these, none of these are eyes. Like, this group still doesn't have eyes. It's still kind of trapped in this black shape. So black is attacking on a very large scale. And, um, and now we can see that... Uh, you know, there's a co, a multi-step co, actually, for the life and death of this group on the right. So one could think of that as being almost alive, because, well, we, they'll fight this co later, and we'll go into detail later when that happens. But for right now, um, White does, you know, start this co to try and kill this group. And even little things... Um, you know, uh, you know, there's these two Ataris that get threatened, and, you know, if Black just resolves this first co, Black is definitely alive, but there's even threats, you know, in this situation, you know, Black could play something like this, and White captures here, well, Black can still just win this one co, and still threaten to get two eyes. So, it's kind of a tricky situation for white. I mean, because this group is pretty decently sized, like if white captures all these stones and takes like basically most of the right side, you know, that would definitely be big, but how many moves is it going to take white, and how many threats of blacks will white have to ignore to do it? It may not be worth it. So, um, this Hane threatens to kill the corner, so white has to come back and defend that. Black retakes the co. And, uh, you know, white comes over here, and black just ignores, which is interesting, to play this move, which is a huge, huge shape point. Um, I just, I want you to look at the difference. If white comes here, white all of a sudden has really beautiful shape. Because, um, first of all, this cut, actually, n neither of the cuts is working, um, obviously, because... White can just capture here, <laughs> so um, that's no good. But also, um, from this position, um, you know, if black you know, does something else, um, white's also threatening to make an eye here, threatening to make an eye here, and, you know, we can just see that there's, there's not really any way, like, these stones get a lot stronger when white plays this Atari right here. So it becomes an interesting you know, sort of situation, and actually, you know, I think if black were to cut here, better than capturing right away would be to descend, because now, if black descends, you capture here, and the stone is also captured, so, uh, you know, just something to look at, but yeah, but this is a huge shape point, um, this ties together, like, all of the, the white stones, um, puts this black stone in Atari, uh, threatens to make eyes very quickly, very easily, so this, this would be a big change in the relative balance of power uh, along the top. But uh, instead, um, White plays this Atari, which is kind of, you know, helping this group 
a bit. If if black can capture here, uh, I mean, if white can capture here, then essentially there's two eyes in the shape pretty easily. But, uh, you know, black just changes the field of the battle over here by pressing in and destroying the white shape. I mean, now you can look at, well, white could do something like this, but even this, I mean, is not quite the same as what we had before. So, uh, white just goes back and continues this co to threaten to kill this group. And, um, and black is kind of, at this point, you know, not... Black is essentially saying, hey, I, if you want to take this group off the board and play the moves to do it, go ahead. I think it's bigger. I mean, because see, if we capture these stones in here and we take this whole area up here, this is obviously like twice the size of this. So, um, white comes back to play this, which is good. Um, this is big territorially, and semi sente in this case, black goes back to restart the co, because, and this is really subtle, but this white capture has really reduced the potential territory up here, even if black comes back to play something like this. Um, this is not as big as it was, and the other thing to notice is that if black does answer this, white got this capture in sente, which is you know, you don't want your opponent to get free profit and sente. So, through a sort of, you know, professional fighting spirit, instead of even worrying about the territory up here anymore, like, Black is going to say, okay, you can clamp me, whatever, just, you know, destroy what I was potentially building up here. Uh, Black restarts the co, uh, restarts the co um, to keep this group alive, saying, you know what, now that you've reduced the potential up here a little bit, I think this is bigger now. So, Black restarts the co, White plays the clamp as a co-threat. Just to, uh, you know, respond to keep, you know, this from totally falling apart. But Black has uh, an idea, which is that, you know, I have so much potential over here that I can just play a big move as a co-threat. Like, this move plus, like, another move to sort of, you know, reinforce the the lower left is bigger than this. So when you're in a situation like this where you, you're, you're basically determined to sacrifice these stones, you can just play big moves as co-threats. And white kinda has to say, all right, well, got it, <laughs> we'll see. And, and this is what I meant by this group being difficult to capture, is that black just continues to ignore, you know, and then the problem is, is that when white does something else, if black wants to at this point, you know, black can even threaten to restart the co, <laughs> which is really annoying. Um, the, uh, you know, there's just, it's a, you know, which is what black does, is, is threatens to restart the co um, when, when white pushes into the corner here. Uh, and then white is playing this threat to attack this big dragon here. And um, black, black handles this really, really well. Uh, this is a great co-threat um, because it's threatening to save the big dragon that uh, white is trying to attack. And actually, it's not even co-threat. Black responds to white's co-threat, and this is a great response. Instead of just trying to run away, now it's like, oh... Shoot, if, if white ignores this and takes the co, black can just cut here as a co-threat now. So white goes ahead and resolves this, but that lets black, uh, you know, basically get two eyes in the corner, one for capturing the two stones and the other... Um, the other down around S3. And the cool thing about this is it looks like black might have to Atari at this point instead of playing here, but you'll notice this is kind of neat. If white plays here, trying to save the group, black plays here, and this is a snapback. Black will just recapture right here. Um, so that, that's not a working variation um, for white. It kind of, kind of looks like black needs to Atari here, but in reality, black is fine. So white just has to resolve this and 
then Black manages to live in the corner with this big dragon. So we can see that this, essentially, this co-threat didn't work. Uh, it wasn't, you know, Black was able to dodge it by making the placement inside over here. And then that placement gave Black this co-threat, and White would have had to um, have done something, you know, right away. Uh, but now Black cuts through. Because now that this group is alive, or alive-ish, I guess white could start a co for the second eye, but black would have to be encircled first, because this type of co to get rid of an eye, if your opponent can just make co-threats to run away, your opponent's going to have like six, seven co-threats just threatening to connect to something else, and that's not going to be not going to be working for you. So here we can see uh, this is kind of the, you know, Black's statement of victory, saying, listen, you know, look at this whole area over here. And we can see white has no big area. White has, uh, you know, this area along the right is pretty big, but black was able to reduce it even and take some of this corner back. There's a little bit down here, a little bit over here. There's nothing that's anywhere near this size. And, you know, white is losing by a lot at this point. Shusaku just never gave his opponent any chance to really catch up. And what we see here, and this is again, you know, just falling back to defend this area over here instead of, you know, counterpincering or doing something crazy. You know, Shusaku is just like, okay, coasting to the win. Uh, White's going to try something because White's a professional player and White's not going to just sit back and die here. And this is pretty crazy, um, you know, White's trying to sort of tie all these scattered stones together into something, and what happens is that, um, you know, Black allows this Atari here, basically in exchange for connecting th these stones to this upper group. Because now this, this Ko back here doesn't really have anything going, um, Instead of being a co that would take away an eye, it's just like a two or three point endgame co. Uh, Black just captures here. White um, Hanes, uh, Black Ataris again, and then White captures. So you can see we kind of have this exchange where White makes this Panuki, Black makes this Panuki. Black connects all of his stones solidly. And with these two stones and this capture and this potential capture, essentially even has an extra eye here now, so doesn't need to worry about this Ko anymore. Because this Ko was kind of like the one thing that, like, if Black got surrounded and then has to fight a life-or-death Ko for a massive dragon, maybe White could get back in the game. So you can see Black is just eliminating Aji here, like, allowing White to just essentially live in the center of the board up here, knowing that this lower left area is still way too big, even if this you know, isn't territory for either player, and white makes five or six points in here, uh, black is still winning by, like, 20 points on the board. So here we see uh, white invade, and this is, you know, this is obviously in a lot of ways an overplay, um, but, you know, white has to try, right? You know, it's like, if white doesn't invade here, white's losing. So, you know, if white invades here and doesn't work, white's still losing and will just resign. So... Um, you know, white tries, kind of pulls out all the stops here, trying to, uh, activate all the Aji, see if there's anything that can be done. Uh, but, you know, there's really not. Black is just too thick, and, you know, the, there's a little bit of reduction that happens, but nothing too severe. And now we see, you know, it's like, well... You threaten this co, maybe we can get an eye in here, but it's really not happening for white. Uh, white connects, black connects. Uh, and it's cool to see how white does activate all this Audrey, because this is kind of what white was aiming at, was to come through here and play this double Hane, which seems kind of crazy, but you should realize this is an option in this situation, because you can start this co, uh, and so you can see that white is trying to win this co and connect out here. But, uh, unfortunately, the, you know, black just puts an end to that. 
and unfortunately white plays this and you can see you know white's intention is to maybe uh, capture these five stones um, which only have two liberties but here's the problem black plays here and there's just not enough for white and white actually resigns here this is where it's like okay there is no more Aji because the thing to note is that we can't um, Atari or something like this because these two stones are in Atari already are gonna get captured and then after black connects here if white pulls these two stones out this makes this a connect and uh, actually that may not no this would actually be a terrible move because <laughs> white would then capture these stones in a snapback <laughs> so don't do that <laughs> um, but uh, alternatively, um, there there are uh, other other things that uh, black can do. Uh, what would be better here? Um, maybe this Atari and come here. Ah, yeah, this seems to be working um, because if we do this and this, white can't cut here because it's Atari, and likewise. Um, you know, if white plays here, black just connects out, and everything's dead. So, um, don't do something stupid and lose the game because there's a snapback you didn't see at the end of the game. <laughs> always, always good advice. But uh, yeah, basically, this area on the lower left is just way too big. Um, you know, white just doesn't have any way to catch up. And then black even made a little territory over here, a little territory on top. Um, but yeah, this massive area over here is just way too big. And, um, you know, at this point, you know, even capturing the Ko is semi-sente. Uh, I guess white could withstand a black extension from here. Uh, it would be kind of nasty. You can see that if white, you know, continues trying to do stuff, uh, if black ignore or if white ignores this to, you know, do whatever, this hurts a lot. Like, this is really limiting. <laughs> You know, even if we're, like, what, we get three points now? That's that's pretty terrible. So, Shusaku's first game as a three-don, um, you know, this was, uh, like I said, from 1842. And, uh, you know, kind of neat to see how he uses the two-stone advantage just to keep white from ever really being in this game. Um, white tries, but, yeah, it's it must be frustrating playing somebody as good as Shusaku and as solid as Shusaku is, um, and having to give him a two-stone handicap uh, seems a little unfair to me, but uh, that's how it was. And, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, Shusaku's still really young uh, at this point. I mean, I think, oh man, I forget what year he was born, but I mean, he's only like 13 or 14, I think, at the point that this game is played. So, you know, there's a little bit, I think, in a conservative culture, um, like, you know, mid-1800s Japan, there's a little bit of like, well, you're not going to be promoted to Five Dawn until you're a little older. You're just too young. You know, you can't, you can't handle it. You can't handle the responsibility. Who knows what was actually going on, but I do know that... Uh, you know, it was more like, you know, getting a, a belt promotion in a martial art. Your teacher would watch you play, and when they felt that your technique had developed to the proper level, you would get the promotion to the next, uh, next Don level. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't like today where you would just, you can win a major tournament uh, like KG did in the second Beilin Cup and just get promoted to Nine Don for winning a world title. Um, which, and KG's only 17, so he just won a world title, got promoted to Nine Don. You'll see it takes uh, Shusaku, um, I think it takes him a little longer uh, <laughs> than, uh, than being 17 to uh, be officially promoted to Nine Don uh, back in uh, 19th century Japan. But I, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. There's some really interesting points, uh, especially shape points right up here. If you, sh you really should be able to see how big this point at J17 is. You know, if, if we just take it and make it a white stone, just how much better the shape is for white up here. And, uh, you know, and now it's almost like, well, shoot, this wall, like, you know, if these stones don't get captured, you know, we might be in big trouble. But uh, that wasn't the game, so uh, something to look at. The forcing exchange over here was kind of cool. 
Um, White's technique in the opening of playing this really aggressive uh, pincer-based opening in the lower right was really interesting. And, uh, yeah, uh, the, White definitely wants to start a fight and hope that Black makes a misstep, and this is the perfect move to do it. And unfortunately, Shusaku plays it really well, and White just doesn't get much out of it, you know? The Black just comes over here, gets out, has, still has potential for making eyes in the corner, just builds up the rest of the board, takes Sente all the time, takes Sente here to cause some problems, and then this was really big, actually. This may have been an oversight on White's part. It seems like it would be much better. It just get, makes black too thick on the upper side. That maybe instead of, uh, you know, so aggressively handling this down here, like maybe here, oh, it hurts so much to allow black to come out here. But maybe, maybe here... It's better to just do, if we just approach directly, is that same sequence still possible? Uh, let's see. Come here. Yeah, see, this isn't looking quite the same. Well, white has to come here, rather. Well, I guess white could. No, here, um, with this stone already here, this would be a way to go. Is the ladder working? White would play here, forcing black to go there. White would play there, forcing... That would be an Atari, but... Okay, yeah, that is breaking the ladder. Um, on the other hand... Black kind of has to... Ah, uh, see, this would be... This would not be quite the same. Um, on the other hand, Black could come in here and totally lay waste to the territory down here. But uh, in the game, it was just a little, little unfortunate to see Black able to do this, and then when White comes back to live... Uh, being able to connect here, because now, now this single white stone is, is really weak, and yeah, it just seems like Black had this game in hand the whole time. So anyway, that's all for this time. Um, I, I know it's been just a little longer than I usually go from making a video. I got a big promotion at work, and am kind of busy right now, but I'm still hoping to do these about once a week, uh, try and stay on top of that. Uh, and uh, thank you for watching. I'll catch you next time.